Hey, welcome to this video on Rust functions and procedures. My name is Doug Milford from Lambda Valley. Let's get started. Functions and procedures are similar and it's really a fine line to make the distinction. Both accept parameters exactly the same way and both can call other functions and procedures. Really, the only difference is that functions return a value while procedures do not. I also want to briefly talk about passing strings as there's a little magic associated with that at the end. Let's go ahead and create both a function and a procedure so that we can compare. I'm going to create a function called sum function. It begins with the fn keyword followed by the function name, which is expected to be snake case, meaning all lower case with an underscore to separate the words. Parameters are passed in the function by the parentheses. If you don't want any parameters, you still need the parentheses. I'll give this two parameters, one as an F32 and one as an I128. You can have as many parameters as you need with whatever types and call them whatever you like. This is just a simple example. You'll need to define what the return type is. So I'm going to tell it to expect an F32 by using an arrow with a dash, not an equal sign, followed by the return type. What this means is I'm going to take your inputs, do some calculations, and return an F32. The body of the function is defined by curly brackets. In the body, you're allowed to write code to your heart's content. I'm just going to print out to the terminal and not return anything quite yet so that you can see what happens. If you don't return any data, you'll get a compile error saying it expected to return an F32, but the function is returning an empty type represented by parentheses, meaning it's returning nothing. It doesn't really matter how much code you have in your function, but at some point, often at the end, you'll need to return an F32 value to get rid of the compile error. To do that, you just provide a value and don't put a semicolon after it. Rust will assume any line without a semicolon after it is meant to be returned from the function. The warning I'm getting is because nothing is calling this function. It's called dead code, and you can override the warning with allow dead code annotation. This is useful sometimes if you have a function or a procedure you'll be using in the future, but haven't hooked it up to anything yet. But normally I like to keep warnings because it quickly identifies obvious things that need to be fixed. I recommend you treat warnings just as seriously as errors and not just override them. We still have some warnings on the parameters because they're not being used, but we'll deal with that in a second. Instead of the allow dead code annotation, I'm just going to use the function and that will eliminate the dead code warning. Okay, back to our function. The number 10.1 could have also represented an F64, as it's just a decimal without enough information to say for sure. But since the compiler knows that an F32 is the return type, it deduces you meant F32. If I make this an integer though, it's too far of a jump and it'll require a bit more for the compiler to know for sure you meant to return an integer as a float. One way to do that is to use the as keyword or there's special notation where you can just put the type at the end of the number. I think this one's a bit weird and confusing to read, but that's just me. Sometimes people use an underscore to give it a little more space and make it a little more readable. Lastly, you can put a dot at the end of the integer to indicate it's a floating point, even if no numbers are after the dot. And if you want numbers after the decimal, that's cool too. Okay, so in addition to just returning a hard-coded value, which isn't very useful, the return statement can be an equation like so. Or a local variable that's been through some calculations like so. Again, the way the compiler knows you want to return a piece of data is there's no semicolon. As long as you're returning a data of type it's requesting, you're good. So one of our parameters still has a warning on it because it's not being used. If you want to get rid of the warning, you can just put an underscore in front of it telling the compiler to ignore it for now. When you're ready to use it, you can just remove the underscore. Obviously, actually using the variable somewhere within the body also gets rid of the warning. I'll add that parameter to our equation and what? Now we get a compile error. We get a compile error because floats and integers aren't the same type and you need to cast something in order to make it work. 
I'll cast our Pram B to an F32 and our compile error goes away. Be aware though that since I'm casting between two different types, this could have some data loss. Sometimes that's okay depending on your needs and if you understand your data well enough to say for sure this is okay. The compiler forces you to address potential memory issues, but you as the programmer can still shoot yourself in the foot. If I saw this casting in real code, I'd be suspicious as someone specifically picked an I-128 to represent their data, meaning they expected it to hold an extremely large numbers that an F32 was never meant to handle. We're going to pretend that it's okay in this specific case though. As a side note, if you have any capital letters in either the function name or the parameter names, the compiler will give you a snake case warning. You can override that warning by annotating with allow non snake case if you like directly on the function. But I recommend you stick with the Rust way of doing things unless absolutely necessary. I'm going to undo that. So, what we've created is a straightforward function that doesn't really do much, but most likely you'll have far more complex logic. Let's just put some simple if statement in there and see what happens. Oh no, we get a big fat compile error. Look at that. Hovering your mouse tells you that your if statement may be missing an else clause. The compiler here is making sure that all situations return an F32, not just when your parameter is less than 100. Here, if the parameter is greater than 100, it never returns anything. We need to create an else branch to catch all remaining situations and make the compiler happy. I'll just give an else branch with a return of negative 1, which also doesn't have a semicolon. So now a float is returned no matter what parameters are entered. The compiler is very good at ensuring that you don't have a situation that could fail to return data. Remember to put a dot at the end of your number to indicate it's a float, not an integer. If you don't, you'll get a compile error because the return type is expecting a float. Now let's create a procedure called some procedure. Note that it still starts with the fn keyword even though it's a procedure. It needs to be snake case or we'll get a warning and has a body just like a function. The difference is that we don't have an arrow and return type and the compiler isn't expecting to return anything. Let's go ahead and print something so that our procedure is at least doing something. I'll use it up in the main function to get rid of the dead code warning. Okay, if we try to return something like we did in our function, we'll get a compile error, and rightfully so. This is a procedure, silly! So really a procedure is just a function without a return type. Let's get rid of that. In our hello world, or any other video we've done up until this point, we've had our main function. In reality, it's actually a procedure because it's not returning anything. Often it's called a main function even though it's technically incorrect, but whatever. Hopefully you have bigger fish to fry than having that argument with someone. Let's talk about passing strings and string slices to functions and procedures as that's a very special topic. I'm going to create a procedure that accepts a string slice and just print it to the terminal. Let's call our procedure a few different ways. First, let's call it with a hard-coded string, otherwise known as a string literal, which under the hood is actually a string slice. So that works just fine as expected. The compiler is happy, no warnings, nice and clean. Let's also create a variable called string slice and see if that works as well. Yep, we're cool. But often you have a string, not a string slice. So let's give that a shot. Uh-oh, you get a compile error. It actually makes sense because a string is not a string slice. But Rust makes this an easy fix. 
If you just put an ampersand in front of your variable, it compiles and works as expected. This might be confusing notation because we really haven't covered what the ampersand actually does, nor is it clear why passing a string, not a string slice, would ever work. It has to do with what's known as coercion. Rust knows how to coerce a string reference into a string slice automatically with the ampersand. As long as Rust knows it's guaranteed that the data will not change while the function or procedure is doing its job, this will work just fine. If the compiler detects potential threading or memory issues, it will start complaining. Rust is very strict, and for a good reason. In any case, Rust made it easy to pass a string into a parameter that expects a string slice by using the ampersand. You can also create a function or procedure that accepts a full-fledged string if you like. Let's go ahead and do that and call it. This compiles just fine, and in most languages, this would be completely trivial, and you call it a day. The function expects a string, and you gave it a string. Ah, but there's a catch. Because of the topic of ownership and borrowing that we haven't covered yet, this can actually cause quirky behavior down the road if you aren't familiar with Rust. Specifically, if I wanted to use my string further down the code, it'll give a compile error. Notice, however, that the string slice version of the procedure doesn't suffer from the same problem. This is where I usually get squinched faces and uh, confused groans that start emanating from the crowd. This compile error actually highlights the very difficulty of learning Rust, even for seasoned developers, but is also at the heart of so many good things downstream. Understanding ownership and borrowing is the very essence of understanding Rust, so make sure you pay particular attention to that video. That topic is too advanced for the stage, and I'm just going to confuse people if I go off the deep end at this point. Feel free to jump to that video when you're ready, though. Note that I can actually get rid of the issue by putting an ampersand in front of the parameter and variable passed in. This will actually work, and your variable can now be used downstream. However, this function is not usable by the string literals or string slices, which makes this form of a string parameter less flexible in some respects. For now, just try to remember that it's usually preferable to define your parameters as string slices. There are use cases where you want to define your parameter as a full-fledged string, such as if you want to mutate your parameter, but string slices are better in many situations. Again, we'll be going deeper in the ownership and borrowing video. It's expected that you may have some confusion at this point. I encourage you to stick with it and grok what you can. More explanation is coming, so stick with it. Well, that wraps it up for this introduction into functions and procedures. Thank you for watching this video. My name is Doug Milford from Lambda Valley, and I'll see you next time.